Welcome to the Finnish Institute, Finland's Institute. Tervetuloa, välkomna. Are you feeling all right? Yeah, okay. Well, nice to see you all. And a special welcoming to our guests all the way from Singapore. Nice to see you guys. My name is Jana Wikman and I'm in charge of our seminars here at the Institute. And uh, well, the aim of these seminars is to promote knowledge of Finnish society in, in Sweden and to debate and discuss various hot topics ranging from uh, defense policies to education and design. And uh, this is actually the fourth time we are arranging an exhibition and a design talk during Stockholm Design Week. And uh, during this talk we want to dig a little bit deeper into the topic that is connected to the exhibition downstairs, Wheel of Woods. And uh, well, the topic is of course wood. And is there something that Finland and Sweden have in common? Well, then it's the forest. We everybody have some kind of relationship to, to the forest and to wood. And uh, we have at earlier seminars, we have discussed, for example, bioeconomy, where wood is uh, one key element or new products of biomass. And now, it's turn. Uh, this time we're going to discuss wood as the material for designers and uh, furniture makers. And are handicraft, small scale production, and limited additions the answers to endorse sustainability? Can sustainable design be both profitable for the companies and affordable to the consumers? Well, this and much more will be discussed by a panel. Please welcome to the stage Johanna Vorio, CEO of Nikari Oy, Susan Ella, furniture and interior designer, Kirsi Gulliksen, architect and the mother of the concept of Wheel of Woods, and our moderator, Mark Eisset, journalist and writer. Please give them a huge applause! Hello, hello. This hello, can you hear us? Can. Oh. Yes, you can. Wonderful to see so many people here. Tremendous. Is it because uh, of uh, what? Because of wood, I suppose. A huge interest for wood these days. Because of women? Maybe. Because of women or because of the man? Yeah. Could be, could be. <laughs> maybe. Well, we're I'm going to tell you a bit about myself. Uh, I'm a, a journalist. I write on architecture. I've, funnily enough, been writing on architecture from the my, almost my very, very first article I wrote was on architecture. It was about a young architect with really long hair and uh, torn up jeans and, uh, and no shoes on, a real hippie, and his name was Jat Vingord. He's got no hair anymore and he's not at all as thin as he was when I met him, where he, when he used to work with Anders Wilhelmsson, who's sitting over there, um, or you had just parted company, I think. And um, I write for Jotte Boys Posten on the West Coast. And uh, I've now got a radio series at, uh, on P8 called Statsinspektionen, where I'm now just beginning my second season. Uh, so I'm looking for eight new Swedish cities to go to and criticize what they're doing with the cities. So if you have any ideas for a city which is in a, you know, facing a great challenge or is doing really well, let me know. Okay? Um, now, who are you then? <laughs> we know each other from previously. Yes. Yes. We know what for ten Gullickson. years or something yeah. like that. Mm. And you've you're responsible for the 
putting together the curating the exhibition. Well, I'm responsible for that, but Johanna is responsible that I'm responsible for that. So it goes like in a loop. Yeah. So it was, uh, what was it, 2015? No, 2014 you approached me to come and set up in a fairly sort of limited schedule and with zero budget something for the Fiskars. Uh, artists and uh, handicraft workers collaborative in, uh, in the Fiskars village to yes. set up their summer exhibition. And, and the topic would be something circling around wood because Johanna's background, of course, is in the wood process or wood manufacturing industry. And um, so that we did, it's a very long, long story, but uh, the short outcoming is that we had an exhibition at Fiskars with several designers from Finland. How many? Old, well, now you're asking two difficult questions <laughs> because it's already two years ago and my mind doesn't work that It seemed that, like that, a reasonably elementary was, question. I think it was about a dozen designers that were directly involved in manufacturing something new yeah. from wood. But then there were several handicraft people and artists working in Fiskars village who already maybe had some pieces ready that we also set up in conjunction. Yeah. And then we invited um, a sculpture from Norway uh, Knut Wold, yes. who's also been busy in many, many uh, art and architecture projects, to set up a series of very substantial wooden sculptures that were quite interesting. We had very sort of, uh, how do you say, heterogeneous spaces to work with. So if you are an exhibition architect, you also start to think about also what will this uh, experience for the visitor be like when all of this is together. So as a small part of this bigger project, we also actually stretched outside of the actual exhibition space into the landscape of Fiskars. And had we had more resources, we maybe would have done even more in the actual forests and in the, in the grounds of the village. But there was limited time, limited budget, as always. But nevertheless, we managed then to set up this very short and, and also time-wise very short kind of matching or trying to match carpenter, carpentry skill from the Fiskar, Fiskars village, which is quite unique in Finland. There are very many, very, very talented people working there, but setting them up also with some designers from outside the village. So it was a little bit this idea that uh, we're exposing the village, which is a very close-knit community, to some ideas from outside of the village. And then and you've, you've traveled with the exhibition since then. Well, the exhibition has traveled and many of the authors have traveled. I have not traveled with it. This is the first time I travel with it. But, uh, or I, I'm, just, I'm just saying hello tonight. But, uh, but yes, uh, we had a satellite exhibition at the Artec uh, flagship store in Helsinki, uh, partially simultaneously with the larger exhibition in Fiskarsbruk. And for those of you who don't know where Fiskarsbruk is, it's about 70 kilometers uh, northwest of uh, Helsinki, or kind of westward from Helsinki. On, on the west coast? Not really on the coast. It's, uh, there's a sea bay that comes quite far inland, a very narrow one, and then that goes into, or actually small rivers and lakes run into that, and, and that's where the Fiskarsbruk is located, because at once upon a time, when the whole activity there started with iron ore, this was of course the particular condition for setting up uh, activity like that. That's where, you know, Fiskars companies' activities have been many years. And that's maybe one of also the mottos of this uh, exhibition that after the original industrial activity has moved out of this village, the artists and the handicraft people and designers have taken over it with the support of the Fiskars company and uh, created what they have been able to create from this setting. So a special setting, whether it has to do with water power or surrounding forests yeah. as a resource for raw materials, always creates particular activity. And that was one of the sort of clues of this exhibition that Johanna's company is working in Fiskars because there's good resources to have good materials and there's also this kind of clustering of skills to yes. which the founders of Johanna's company have been contribu contributing. 
did you say that the exhibition has been traveling internationally? It has been in Paris also, yes. and uh, we had some efforts to try to get it to Japan, but that was a little far stretch because okay. we didn't really have an organization. Was it a that. smaller exhibition in Paris than the one you had in Fiskersh? Yes, yes, it was smaller. Mm -hmm. Yes, it was mainly focusing on these works that that came about or or have since come about in, okay. in relation with this exhibition. So the most of the works that were created before this whole project started have not traveled. No. And then, of course, these huge pieces of sculpture are difficult to move around. No, it's, it's just a logistic yes, problem also, even if they are log sculptures so that they could be taken apart. But it's always easier to travel with a nice set of uh, small lightweight lamps okay. and so forth. And, and now in Stockholm, and with an exhibition which is downstairs, and the exhibition is designed by Mia Kulin, who is sitting at the Where very back there. Mia? I think Mia should stand up and get applause. Mew. Who has also helped out in, any, in many other ways with this exhibition here in Stockholm, right? Yes, I guess for Mia one could say that Mia has really sort of incorporated this Finland sake vor. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> and Johanna, you, you are with Nikari situated in uh, Fiskars. Yes. And you, um, you took over the company when? Um, it was actually I came to work there as a managing director in 2009 yeah. and we had this agreement with the founder of uh, Nikari that we would see how we get along. Kari Virtanen. Kari Virtanen, yeah. yes, uh, for the first six months. Mm -hmm. and, and then we actually got along really, really well and it was very, very interesting to learn about the company and, and talk with the cabinet makers and really listen to all these brilliant stories dating back to 1967 when Kari was very, very young himself and he founded the company and the first customer was Alvar Aalto's architect office for the next seven years. So, so all these stories from the 60s, 70s and forward, they were unbelievably inspiring for me as well. Mm, I can imagine. And yes. you'd been at Avarte before that? Yes, I was working at Avarte in product development and yes. marketing and sales also mm -hmm. before that. You've got, a, you've got an interesting background it, uh, academically. Mm. You are wood engineer. Yes. And you've also got a business ex education, right? Yes, we had. We started this special program in current day Aalto University in Helsinki in the 90s, and I was one of the first uh, groups to participate in it. Mm -hmm. It was called International Design Business Management. So I was studying two majors, basically. I studied wood technology and international design business management. Mm -hmm at the same time. And then some business strategia in Milano. <laughs> <laughs> and what's your connection, what's your connection to, the, um, to the exhibition, if any? Uh, the Will of Woods. Well, as Kirsi already explained a bit, um, uh, when I was um, the uh, chairman of the board of the Fiskars Cooperative of Artists and Designers and Craftsmen, uh, we always, every year, the cooperative uh, thinks about an, an exhibition to organize mm -hmm. and I remember there were a lot of every year there's a lot of talk about what to do uh, what is it ceramics this year is it wood what it is uh, but at that year it was the time for wood and we had done something before with Kirsian and everyone at the at the board had seen the results that had been done in Helsinki before so um, it was sort of like the uh, joint wish to ask Kirsi to curate the next ex exhibition, and Kirsi really did. They that. might have regretted that later, <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah, Kirsi did a tremendous job, and and the result was really, really exceptional, and beautiful, and got a lot of international recognition as well. Yes, uh, as you talked already, and we were, I think, the whole Fiskars village was very happy with mm. the with Wheel of Woods. Yes. And they put out, put on one exhibition a year, usually. Yes. Do you say that's Sometimes pretty too. ambitious, isn't it? Is and what are they exhibiting? Are they exhibiting newly produced stuff, especially for the occasion, or? It depends. Uh, it depends, but very very often they are new things because uh, they the 
it's a special village. We we have only approximately 600 inhabitants yes. and more than 100 members of cooperative. So, so you can imagine that there is an artist or a craftsman in every family in in Fiskar. Wow. So, so it's quite a creative bundle, and and people collaborate and talk together, and and there's always something new going on. And and we have also. Today here at Willa Woods, one cabinet maker from Fiskars called Matti Söder Kultalahti, who is the master wood turner from Fiskars mm. also. So it's, uh, there's always someone thinking about something and then uh, suggestions for collaboration. And usually almost everything you see at the, at the summer exhibition are new things. That's incredibly impressive, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, yes. Is Matti here in the audience? Unfortunately, no. No. no? no. Okay. Okay. But so Matti's bowls are there. Yes. They're worth checking out. Yes. Um, so, so you don't live in Fiskar? No, I don't. No, but you do own your own forest. Uh, quite near Fiskar. <laughs> quite near Fiskar, and <laughs> you're, a part, an you're part of the uh, you're part of the exhibition yeah. uh, with um, one of those yes. lamps. Yes. Bowls. Maybe you should show, bowls, show the bowl so people just hold it up so yeah. people can see it. Yeah, actually, I, I bought this with me because um, at the moment uh, I have a five year state grant for forest work. And uh, actually, it's a designer grant, but it's for forest work and also thinking about uh, new kind of produ products. And f what I have been learning I in uh, last two years, I think it's quite amazing, that like this piece, even if, it's, if this was ready two weeks ago, the age of this is 90 years old. Mm -hmm. So I think it's quite impressive, you know, how the raw materials are, or how, how that our, our, our life is paced uh, with raw materials, everything, yes. you know, mm. this one. Yes. And it's, it takes so much energy, so much time, so much work to produce all these things. And I, I think if, uh, if we understand how the, uh, how the raw material is, uh, how is the circulation, we can consume more wisely. Because, you know, it's so much work when you start to <laughs> cut the wood and, oh, and exactly. do everything. Couldn't you, couldn't you just take us through? I mean, the, the background of that product is your own forest. So, so if, if we start with the tree, what happens then? Do you go out there with a saw and... Uh, I started because uh, I, I wanted to know how to cut the tree. Yeah. Like, Precisely that I know exactly where it falls. Yes. When I saw it, then I, I googled and I found one uh, lumberjack in Tammisaari, which is the near nearest city, where my forest is. And then she said, "Yes, I can teach you." And then I asked that you know if uh, he can uh, make a plan how to take care of the forest. And then I learn about continuous cover forestry, uh, which means that uh, forest always looks like forest. It's not empty. We don't take a big machinery there and cut ah. everything. But we plan w w which trees to take, take out. And you know, we have old ones and baby trees there at the same time. But my small forest is, uh, it was used to be this um, Economical forest, or how do you call it? Economical okay. forest. Uh, Talos Metsä. Which, so, which means what? Uh, that you know... That you harvest wood. Yeah, you know, mm. by machine. So now we are, you know, uh, we were really happy when we saw, you know, like a small baby pine trees there last weekend. Mm -hmm. So, and then I have some old ones. But it's quite a um, young forest. It's about 90 years old. Okay. And because it's uh, in Hanko, the soil is uh, sand, so the, they don't have so much energy there. So they are growing really slowly. 
and you know now when we are taking you know some uh, trees out to give more light to other ones or maybe some has a small Ill illness or whatever we find out. Um, and what, what species do you have there? Which type of tree? Pardon? What, which type of tree? Uh, it's pine. Pine tree. Yeah. Pine tree. So you cut down the tree. Yeah, the lumberjack taught you how to cut it down. Yeah, and I you, What do you do next? Okay, um, then we uh, take the branches off. Yes. Do you use them for anything? Uh, for energy. Mm hmm. Just yeah, there you is know, some, burning uh, them in the fireplace. No, no, no. There is this uh, a company who collects all the branches mm -hmm. and then they uh, bring them to the some kind of a power. Mm -hmm. They make so chop out of them. They chop them, right? Hockey, hockey, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that can be used as little pellets. There, it's actually kind of a pellet that when you cut it, chop it like this, and then you can use that. There are special ovens even where you can use this hockey, mm -hmm. and there's even special power plants where you can use hockey. Yeah. Which are or pellets. Yeah. Quite common in Sweden too, of course. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, then we cut the trunks because they are really tiny because they are we don't cut the uh, biggest ones because we are we let them grow. And then the local uh, sawman comes to take them and then we start start uh, start to saw saw them and we look you know what kind of sewing would be nice to do in because it depends on the wood if it's not straight if it's like curvy a little bit or if it's small or bigger you have to dry them first don't Pardon? you do you dry them no first first, first we cut them first and then cut. we okay. dry them okay but also, also I'm, I'm doing experiments so we are doing other things also than just the sewing Sewing is just a traditional way to do it. Yeah. You can also split and uh, yes, very yeah. interesting. And now we have uh, took the bark off and the um, trunks are drying and you know, and I'm also thinking that maybe I can use wet wood and uh, what happens if the, you know, if I'm, you know, you have, and how to use maybe the smell of the wood and what happens if the wood is living, still living, or what, and what, would that, what would that look like if you were to use wet wood? Mm, I think this is this is not possible to do with the wet. Okay. This is just uh, traditionally made. Okay. Why isn't it's not it experimental you have it's to at all. My total it's ignorance when it comes <laughs> to wood, but why wouldn't that be possible to do in wet wood? Because the uh, wood it is would fall apart. Yeah, it would yeah. crack everywhere, little yeah. by little, yeah. when it dries. So it would, oh, quite an interesting expression. Mm -hmm. I, uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, because wood is living by the, uh, if it's humid or dryness in the air or... Yeah. yeah. Which must mean that you, who export furniture, must pick wood which is treated possibly or best quality wood that can be exported because if it ends up in the Middle East, for example, where it's humid or wherever, yes. uh, it could uh, it crack. It could crack. Get, get broken. Yeah? I can tell a very unfortunate example of this. I had a client in Japan who wanted to have Morris tables, not the small ones that are down there, but large dining tables in massive wood, which means that the, the thickness of the of the board plate is, yeah. you know, less it's less than sixty millimeters, but it's still substantial. And then it's evened out on the ends, which actually brings the real problem in there. And we discussed this back and forth with the with the carpenter who I work with, and we both said no, this will not work, you know, you'll end up with a wobbly mm -hmm. uh, tabletop because of the of the seams where these are glued together and because of the of the uh, how do you say the edge detail which is uh, thinner and thinner and thinner so it's not possible to make it so unless we start to do something very serious inside the in the gluing phase and so forth but the client insisted he said no 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 you know i want them so i said okay what we do is we ship you two of these 
and then we ship you two that we have done differently, which are a little bit fake, you know, and then you might get two tables that are even, and then you return the wobbly tables to us at your cost. No, no, they won't be wobbly. Well, they were wobbly. Then we started the two-year, you know, email correspondence with the client that, you know, why the tables are wobbly, and we tried to explain to him in every possible way that we said these will be wobbly, you know, but you wanted them. So, yeah. so it is, uh, wood is tricky. Yeah. You really have to sort of understand what you're doing with it. And uh, as Susan is doing, you know, I, I don't think you, any carpenter even would come and say that I know everything about wood because you never will. Yes. It will always surprise you in one way or another. And that's part of the fascination. Yeah. Also, I think that you're living with something that you can't completely control. Yeah. Like, the, the, like the you would material, yeah. in synthetic materials. Yeah. Have you been in that situation at all? Have you, have you exported stuff that... We are extremely careful and we have certain products, we just... This, this naturally happens, the same thing that the customer is asking that can't you make it like this, but we just don't. We just explain that it's impossible, we can't do it with our methods. And, and we will provide you something that will work. So, so use, we have certain products that are super safe to say. The, the, all, the, all the joinery is thought in a way that it will last the big humidity changes. Um, usually the lucky thing is that in the Nordic countries we have four different seasons and the uh, humidity changes are big, but very often, for example, uh, Japan or Singapore, the humidity is bigger, it's uh, higher than, than in Finland. And, and if, you, if you do the joinery in a certain way, it usually lasts much better when it goes to a more humid area than if it goes to a drier area. Mm. Naturally, nowadays, there is a lot of air conditioning in, so indoors, which makes any area very dry, and then you have to take that into account. But uh, um, we, just, we are just very careful in the sizing and, and the mat material thickness and the solutions in order to keep them mm. working. But there's always surprises. There are always, and mm. it's also because all the every single tree trunk is unique. Yes. Like us human beings, they are natural material. You never know what is found in un underneath the surface, basically. No. Yes. Do you ever wish that you worked with plastic? Mm, sometimes we are joking about that. Oh, Cartel. Synthetic. <laughs> that would <have> been. <laughs> <laughs> but no, no. That's why it's so fascinating as well. You. Yeah. Can I comment something on, on Susan's project, you know, when she's talking about the fact that, that, for example, the wood she used for this bowl is 90 years old. Uh, I would just like to give you a piece of information what that price for a cubic of that kind of wood, which is a pine, basically a pine trunk that is not used for uh, paper production, but is used for, for sawmill pro produce is 56 euros per cubic meter, mm -hmm. okay? And one large, uh, on average, and one large in the forest, yes. you know? And one large trunk might be, you know, maybe three to five uh, cubic meters. So one cubic meter of this stuff is worth 56 euros, which is incredibly ridiculous as is being pointed out. So the fact that one is trying to refine it also with design and by choosing the trees, you know, into a sort of higher level, let's say. And, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that, how should I formulate this? I just, ge I just think that this price reflects exactly the attitude that we have towards this material in Finland, which has been the sort of basic industrial raw material yeah. for us for se several decades. So that's why we don't really always see the wood from the forest or the forest from the wood. Mm -hmm. You have to treat it with greater care, you mean, or as if it's a precious <coughs> and also, Yeah, and also maybe sort of uh, give up this idea that, uh, that it's just like a field, you know, that can be harvested, mm -hmm. because that's mm -hmm. the way that the forests were treated in Finland for decades for the, for the purposes of the paper production 
Mm. Which was which, which was the major one of the major cornerstones of the industry, and now of course that is we're, changing now. That is changing. So that is also part of why the state has started this uh, bioeconomy program that was mentioned in the introduction here earlier, and that is why these kind of design uh, driven uh, working with wood should be more sort of um, how would I say more forcefully part of that kind of uh, program but they haven't really seen the light totally yet. So it's very industry, mm -hmm. uh, how would you say, oriented, mm -hmm. so that you have to have large scale production and kind of this largeness that it, in a way you could also say that they want to have kind of a lot of uh, profit in short term or a lot of profit with, with uh, less work. Yes, they don't do like you, Susan, pick exactly. the tree no. Cut it down. They or like Johannes down. Carpenters, yeah. or yeah. Yeah, because, maybe it's it's a, there is a significant generation shift going on, uh -huh. I think, mm -hmm. and and it uh, you can really see that the new forest owners are thinking much more like you as well. There is that there are naturally different kind of mindsets, but still there are mm. more and more people asking even from us that what do you say? Should I just start to grow ash? Mm. Oh, oak, and mm. what should we mm. do? Mm. And and very interested also in in producing good wood for design purposes, furniture purposes, and so mm. on. Mm. And, uh, talking about price, how much is your forest? How much did you pay for your forest? Uh, in this area where my forest is, the the seaside is uh, more valuable. The forest goes so slowly there, so my... Ah, okay. uh, uh, is, is that because of the soil, that it's yeah, sand? Yes, because it's soil. sand. Mm -hmm. yeah. So did you ask that how much my forest cost? Yeah. <laughs> Should I say it? Yeah, how much did you pay for your forest? <laughs> Can I buy but, a forest? Well, did, did you buy it or did you get it? Uh, I bought that. You bought it? There were no, two companies. Now it's owned by my company. And? <laughs> <laughs> it was a price uh, with a re, uh, very nice car. <laughs> That's very so like uh, thirty thousand euro, forty thousand euro, uh, something like that. Okay, okay. Good guess. And then the the next question, of course, is why did you <laughs> buy this forest for this uh, car price? <laughs> because I had already car. <laughs> 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 okay, but um, <laughs> any other reason? Uh, because I have a, uh, I have a summer house just next to this yeah? forest. Were they planning to cut it down, and you bought it because you wanted to preserve it, or no, no, no? no? You it wanted to use the, use it for yeah, and your design. my family have some lands hmm? in this area, hmm? so it was. Hmm. Okay, interesting. That's the family business. I, I, I can consider that. You could buy forests. Yeah. Yes, you know, <gasps> 20 or 30 years ago you couldn't, but since yeah. Finland is part of EU, now you can. Oh, okay. The land ownership was free. And, and the price of forest, has that shifted since uh, paper pulp has gone down? Uh, well, you know, you define the, the price. If you, if you have a piece of land that is just forest, yes. it doesn't have any structures on it, it doesn't have any no. power lines going through it or anything, it's just forest. Then the land, uh, the mark, you know, marka Close that you land, have, yeah. mm -hmm. that has a very low value. But it also depends where you are in Finland. Yeah. If there's any other interest to this piece of land other than forestry, or the trees, mm -hmm. then it might have a higher value, like for the, you know, for a lot for a summer house or something like that. But let's say that you are in the middle of Finland, for which I have that forest, I have a very particular term, which is in Finnish called pöpelikke, which is, you know, this kind of mixed forest that has everything in it. It has young birches, young spruces, young pines, less pine than, you know, this sandy soil has. But it's kind of a typical, it's called also the, the blueberry type, yeah. actually, in the biotope in, in, uh, in Finland. So if you have that kind of land in the middle of nowhere, but you have a little dirt road going somewhere next to it so that the, the truck of the Enso, Stura Enso or, you know, UPM or somebody can come by easily to harvest your or get your woods, then you pay maybe, you know, 
let's see, you pay about 2,000, about, yeah, you know, for 20 hectares for just the forest, you pay less than 2,000 euros. But the value of that piece of land is in the trees. Yes. So then it's calculated what is the volume and what kind of trees you have Cubic there. Cubic meters. Yes, yeah. and then you refer that to the current market price. And all the forest owners have their ways of, you know, they have their... It's very organized forest ownership. You, you know a tremendous well, amount. Well, I, I have a forest, but <laughs> it's further up <laughs> in the north. Uh, one more. So. And Nikari almost has a forest too, don't you? Or Fiskar has its own forest, right? Fiskar owns a lot so, of forest, yeah. yes. Yeah. So lot. your material comes from the forest next doors. Sometimes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Not all of it. As, as, no? as Susan said, we don't want to cut everything there. No. Mm. So, so we are sourcing. Um, well, we are collaborating with a local sawmill, yeah. and and they are sourcing from the as much as possible from the neighboring forests. But naturally, let's say that's the, like northern European area. Yes. So we also source, for example, oak from from southern Sweden and. Germany. Ah, okay, mm. okay. Yes. But you have quite a few different types of trees in that forest, I read. 16 different types or something yes. in, in the Fiskars forest. Yes. Which must be a great advantage. It is, and it's also um, the look of the forest. They are very special there, yeah. very special in Finland. So it's also like a, a nice thing for your senses to walk around those forests. Mm. <laughs> but isn't it so that it's also because this um, valley where the village is located and some of the forests around it has a very particular bioclimate, yes. you know, sort of, or microclimate, that it's always in the spring when you go there, on one of the first sunny days after the snow is gone, it's always like four to five degrees warmer in Fiskars than it is elsewhere. So people who are having a beer on the terrace there, they get sunburned much earlier than anybody else. So that's so. Yeah, it yeah. is. It is. Yes, like Maybe like not four or five, but it, it, there there is a difference you can yeah. actually feel. Yeah. It's a good microclimate for forests, especially. Yeah. And naturally, it is also an er area. Fiskars was uh, founded there in 1649, so it's an old area oh. of um, manor houses, and mm -hmm. the owners, earls and dukes uh, of the area used to uh, order good ash and oak seeds from Denmark and mm -hmm. Germany back then, oh. many like hundreds of years yeah. ago, and, and they plant those seeds already then, so that's why we have quite good... Um, uh, like hardwood forests mm. as well. Ah, interesting. Mm. Uh, is that the reason why you've decided to stay there? Be I remember. I can imagine that. I mean, workforce prices uh, must be much higher in Finland than in, in any other country you could work in. True. Yes. And, but it's, it is also an ideology and a philosophy. Mm. Uh, it's really important for us to try to keep these craftsmanship skills alive. Yeah, and we that's have, a good point. Yeah. yeah, it is really important. It is, you know, you can't really be a designer or an architect if you don't have someone, a craftsman, with you. No. Uh, if you want to work very profoundly with different materials, raw materials. So, so for us, it's also something that we want to... Uh, underline that we always have trainees, we have always had them for the last 50 years and and for example we are collaborating with Malmsteen Skola here in Stockholm so we have a master degree students uh, coming to train at Nikari every year. Mm. Is, it, uh, is it an outdying trade? This the, or the, the handicraft, uh, is that knowledge well, this is this is interesting. It, it feels um, I don't know if there is a good academic research about this. So no. now it's a bit more like how it feels. Oh. But uh, there, it is also a generation shift there. Um, our um, one of the partners of Nikari from previous years, Rudi Mertz from Switzerland, he moved to to Finland. Uh, in the 60s, late 60s, and he said that it, being a cabinet maker from Switzerland, it felt 
horrendous <laughs> to hear this this Finnish saying that if someone wanted in the 70s, if, so, if someone wanted to compliment your work, they said that ah, it's almost as good as someone who had made it in a factory. Mm. And, and, uh -huh. and for a, for a craftsman, it was like ha ha ha, thank you, <laughs> a horrible thing to say. So so nowadays it's not you don't hear no now now it's upside down i'd say the people are starting to uh, appreciate craftsmanship and handmade things oh. special more unique feeling mm. and what you're doing with the company now johanna is interesting or you've done from the start but uh, you you're taking it much much more international now uh, i mean you work with international designers um, uh, so you and you've you've brought in a design element which is much stronger now than uh, in Kari Virtanen's day. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in a way. Mm -hmm. Well, well, that we had long talks with Kari Virtanen before I started, and that was um, that was his his wish. He wanted us to tell the story also abroad. He didn't have time or resources to do it himself no. at the time, and and. And he also wanted us to concentrate on the furniture collection. And actually, starting with Alvar Aalto and then Kai Frank and continuing with different designers throughout the 80s and 90s, Nikari had done these kind of things before. No one just never told anything about them. Oh, okay. So Good marketing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, well it was, uh, Nikari was maybe a bit like secret service mm. for certain <laughs> architect offices. Secret in service? Yes, yeah. and, and design uh, offices in Finland. Mm. And you hear Kari Virtanen and Rudi Mertz's uh, memories, they have done so many things, so many interesting things. It's just no one has told yeah. about them. And that's why we, we wanted to um, fulfill the dream, to tell the story. And that's why we are in, at the Stockholm Furniture Fair. And, and so we started in 2012 to tell the story abroad as well. Mm -hmm. But maybe it's also because uh, times have changed a little bit that earlier on your carpentry workshop as many others also worked for projects. Yes. So when there was a big construction, public big construction project, be it a church or a yes. whatever, you know, culture hall or something like that, there would always be furniture designed particularly for that. And they often became, like many of Aalto's models as well, became then part of the sort of standard yeah. production, or they were adopted in one way into that, or they, be, they became the platform from which a standard production was generated. This doesn't happen that much anymore, because the budgets are drawn up in different ways, and also the structures of the projects have changed a little bit. So that's another another thing that has probably formed the, the activities of your company as well. Yes. yes. Mm. This makes me think of one thing that you mentioned on the phone to me, Kirsi, mm. that your attempt with the exhibition was to do something similar, to, to, to get the, uh, the craftsmen to team up with designers, mm -hmm. just like Timo Sarpaneva and Tapio Virkala did with glass uh, blowers in the 50s. Mm -hmm. uh, what, has the, what has the result been? It could be much better, you know. It's, it was very limited resources. And then that is maybe one of the big problems altogether with these fields that, uh, you know, like um, I think uh, when Vitra was acquiring Artec some years ago, maybe five years ago now, Rolf Feldbaum said something that was really on the mark. The, head, said, of, the head of Vitra, yeah, yeah? Then head of Vitra, now it's his niece that is taking o has taken over. But nevertheless, Rolf said that these design companies that manufacture, for example, furniture, they always have a much larger identity than what is really their activity. Mm that it's almost like 10 or 20 times larger identity in the, in the sort of mind of people who watch things like this than what is really the sort of the size of the activity. That is very true. And then when you look at the, uh, the sort of wood, uh, you could say sort of wood manufacturing industry, and now talking about the finer part of it, it's still very small even if a company might have an increasingly big identity, but the volume still is fairly small. This went for Artec also for decades and decades and decades. 
And um, that is something that I could see that uh, we have discussed this with Johanna already, maybe five or six or seven or ten years, that there should be, you know, and we admire you Swedes because you always seem to be, you know, kind of clever in these things that you say, okay, now we take fashion and we bring Swedish fashion, you know, to the world. or mm -hmm. And then you concentrate on that or we bring Swedish crime series to the world and then you concentrate on that or something like that. So we should do the same thing in Finland. We should say we take Finnish designed wood pieces to the world and now we concentrate on that and give all the... That's what you're doing now. Well, yeah, in a <laughs> very small, small scale. very small scale. So there, there should be some more resources mm -hmm. to do that because all the carpenters, all the designers, the only kind of out, uh, how would you say, exterior funding they can get for projects like this is usually grants. And grants are not very, very, you know, there's not a high volume of grants. Yeah. And even if you get a nicer grant, it's still not all that much money, you know. Yeah. So, unfortunately, you need a little bit more money to really start something on a long term. Mm. And then all these projects always suffer from that. And it doesn't matter to how many bureaucrats to talk about it or, you know, how high people in the ministry or wherever, you know. it's We are not a technology business in that way. In fi Finland, <coughs> one of the problems is that we're always in another way geared to sort of one thing. So it can be the computer games, okay, great, we do that. And But the manufacturing, you know, the skills of the hand, understanding materiality, doing something with that, combining culture and livelihood is not that much appreciated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's very really much what all three of you is keeping alive. Pretty much, yes. we try to do that. And at, um, the same, at the same time, there is the, the sort of an imbalance. Still, there are more designers than craftsmen, mm. and 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 you you just it's very difficult to find find someone to do this mm -hmm. to team up with. Yeah. Questions from the audience. Time flies. Yeah, yeah. Oof. <laughs> Um, do we have time for questions? Yeah. One question. One question. <laughs> Sorry well, about that. That's very Finnish. <laughs> <laughs> but we can do questions in the opening. Anybody yes, can come up course, to us and, of course. Uh, and you ask, can ask the three you questions down at the exhibition. Can I make but one more comment? Yeah, but maybe we should just give the chance to the audience to ask uh, something, if there is a question or not. It, might, it usually takes a few seconds for that hand to reach up and say no, nothing <laughs> at all. <laughs> Everything is what said. <laughs> well, I would just like to uh, thank you a couple of people who have really been working very hard to make this thing happen. First of all, of course, the Finnish Institute. Thanks for having us here. It's really nice to be in the heart of Stockholm. And then I would like to thank Petri and Mikael and Mia for setting this whole thing up here. So we are your humble servants. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yes. And thank you for this. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for listening too. Yes. Thank you, the panel and Mark. Thank you. Thank you for good work. And I just want to welcome all of you downstairs to the opening of this exhibition, We Love Woods. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.